Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at the temperature probes, how they work, and the major topics that come up in regards to patient temperature in the operating room. Let's get started. Temperature is an important thing to measure in the OR, as hypo and hyperthermia are known to not only cause problems physiologically, but may be also bad omens of things to come, as is the case in malignant hyperthermia. As such, it is important that we keep a close eye on our patient's temperature whilst in the OR. Normal temperature, and we'll write normal here, is about 36 to 38 degrees Celsius, which equates to about 97 to 99 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, this is a rough range and it may vary slightly from person to person. Now it should be known that temperature is non-homogeneous, which means that the various compartments don't necessarily have the same temperature. Things like the deep thoracic and the abdomen and central nervous system temperatures are different than that of the limbs and different of that of the skin, and as such may give you various temperatures at various places. So when we discuss temperature in the operating room, we're usually talking about core temps. And the core temperatures refer to very specific places, including the tympanic temperature, pulmonary artery temperature, distal esophagus, and the nasopharynx. So some other temperature sites that are commonly used that you'll see, but are not quite as accurate, are places such as the axilla, the skin, and the bladder. Now the bladder, it should be known, is not actually a core temperature and is only a reliable reading when there is good urine flow. Again, good urine flow is the only time bladder temperatures are accurate. So next, how does it work, meaning the temperature probe? We're not going to get into too much detail with this just because it's not as high yield and we can't really manipulate it as much. Uh, there are really two types. There are thermistors and resistance sensors. And they base, both basically work on the same concept in that they look at either, whichever one you're looking at, either the voltage output or the resistance experienced in the metal wiring of the probe, and the computer is then able to generate a temperature based off of those things. And remember, resistance and voltages change based off of the temperature of the metal that you're looking at as a result of molecules moving in them. Uh, the faster molecules move, the harder they crash into one another, and the more often they crash into one another, thus changing the resistance and changing the voltage outputs. As I said, clinically, the way it works isn't as high yield as some of our other monitors that we can interact with uh, because you really can't adjust your, your temperature probe aside from placing it uh, in a more central place. So the next thing we should look at, and probably the most important thing here, is major temperature changes, again signified by the delta, in the OR and really what they mean, what we're gonna do about them, things like that. And so the first major temperature change that we're gonna talk about is a function of what's called redistributive heat loss. And again, this is going to come up on your boards or exams at some point, so you should be aware. The temperature drop is often a decrease by 0 0.5 to 1.5 degrees Celsius, and it's going to happen just after induction. So why is it? Why does this happen? Now, it's called redistributive heat loss, even though it's not a true heat loss, it's a heat redistribution, is a result of pooling of blood in the periphery. Now, normally our core has a large volume of warm blood, but as we all know, many of the agents used on induction, such as propofol, can cause peripheral vasodilation. That leads to the warm core blood pooling in the extremities. As a result, the core temperature has a quick drop off. This is later rectified as the patient begins to accommodate for their decreased vascular tone by increasing their vascular tone or when we give pressors and blood proceeds to circulate back to the core. Again, 
emphasize this will be something that you will see on your in-service exams and your boards. Now the other major thing we have to talk about is the three ways we lose heat in the OR. So I know it's been a while for some people who've been out of college for a bit, but the three methods are one, conduction. And this is the movement of heat via direct contact of two solids. The operating room example of this would be to place a warm patient on a cold table, but I don't think any of us hopefully have ever done that. Making conduction not really a big player as far as heat loss in the OR. Two, convection. And that's the convection. Sorry for my spelling. And convection is movement of heat via fluid, which could be air or liquid. Uh, but again, in the case of the operating room, we aren't really circulating cool air over the patient that would then take heat away and then move it around. Now, bear hugger is obviously warm air, but we'll talk about that uh, shortly because it's not exactly convection as the air isn't cool moving over the patient, absorbing heat and moving away. Now, the most relevant form in the operating room of heat loss is via radiation, which is the movement of heat as a function of electromagnetic waves. Usually down their gradient as far as heat and energy go. Now all of these are going to be down their gradient until they reach equilibrium. In this case, because the temperature of the patient tends to be much warmer than that of the surrounding room. As a result, the patient will radiate heat and energy away into the room down the gradient with the overall natural goal for there to be an equilibrium of temperature between the patient and their surroundings. We all know operating rooms can be quite cold, so this would not be ideal. So as a result, we aim to keep our patients warm. Keep warm. Keeping patients normothermic, of which the most common way, and I would be remiss if I didn't discuss it, is the bear hugger. And I know, or I hope you've all seen this in the operating room at some point. The bear hugger is a device that lies either on top of the patient or under the patient and has warm air circulating in it. And what this does, in part, is that it reduces the temperature gradient between the patient and their surroundings. Since the blanket of warm air around the patient is actually quite warm, even though it does take time to get to its maximum temperature, there is slower and less radiation of heat away from the patient to their surroundings. Then, once the bear hugger is left on long enough and it's able to reach its maximum temperature of 43 or 37 or whatever you set it to, it will start radiating heat away from it towards the patient and the patient is cooler and the patient will begin to absorb heat from the bear hugger, thus beginning to warm them. So oftentimes after placing your bear hugger, the patient will continue to drop their temperature a little bit because the hugger needs to warm up. Then once the case has gone long enough and the bear hugger has been able to fully reach its maximum temperature and start radiating heat in towards our patient, it will then help to heat them up. Now, the other way that we talk about that also will come up on exams at some point is warming the room. Warming the room. And you're going to see this a lot in burn operating rooms and pediatric operating rooms. And I've seen them get upwards of 85, 90 degrees sometimes to ensure there's a minimal radiation of heat away from the child. And this is because they're much more prone to heat loss as a result of their large body to volume, large body volume to surface area ratio. By warming the room, again, much like the bear hugger, you are effectively decreasing the temperature gradient between the patient and their surroundings, which would lead to a slower heat loss. Again, I emphasize the larger the gradient between two things, the faster the change will occur, and so decreasing the gradient will help to minimize heat loss for the patient. That's all for the basics of temperature monitoring. If you have any questions or topics you want covered, please write in to us. Otherwise, check in for the next video.